So welcome everybody. Welcome to this Tuesday's uh, PhD support group meeting. I'm Lenny Liebenberg. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the PhD journey can be pretty demanding. Um, it can be very overwhelming at times, if I remember correctly. And we all depend on various forms of support or uh, coping mechanisms. And sometimes um, these ways in which we try to help ourselves can sometimes turn unhealthy or are inherently unhealthy. Uh, so today, the UKZN Student Support Services team uh, will join us again, and they'll lead the discussion on issues related to substance use and, and abuse. Uh, but before we begin, just quickly, um, I'd like to remind everybody that this is a very informal uh, session, so please feel free to place any comments in the chat box, any questions in the chat box, uh, use your reaction icons whenever you feel like you'd like to uh, express yourself, um, in a constructive manner. Uh, also, if you feel that you, uh, you, you might be too shy to engage the group, um, uh, feel free to send me a private message or any one of the uh, SSS team members, and we'll be happy to read your message anonymously and address uh, your, um, what you'd like to say within the session. Right, very quick. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to the UKZN Student Support Services team. Um, uh, to Wuli in particular, who will then hand over uh, to the special guest presenter. Thank you very much for joining us, both SSS team and all our participants. Go Thank ahead, you, Prof. Lenin. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, so greetings students and colleagues. Thank you for having us, the SSS team, back on this platform. It's wonderful to spend this hour with you again. So today's topic is on substance use and abuse. And we have amongst us a special guest presenter, Mr. Tony Subramani, to share with us his extensive knowledge on this aspect. We welcome Mr. Subramani, and I will introduce him to you shortly. This is a critical topic that requires focus and discussion, as we at Student Support Services find that many postgraduate students reach out for support in terms of an addiction. So the use of alcohol, the use and abuse of alcohol and, and drugs is a problem that affects all, irrespective of our age, social status, race, or culture. Substance use and abuse is recognized as one of the most significant health and social issues in our community. Though society and religion frown upon substance use, the past few decades have seen the development of a subculture where the use of substances is accepted. Against the background of community changes, substance abuse and substance use have become more freely and substances have become more freely available, sorry. So the past two years in particular, combined with the unexpected stresses that we have all endured, has seen an increase in the use of substances and the subsequent impact that this has had on our individuals families and communities. A greater range of drugs has become available and there appears to be an increased acceptance of drug-related behavior and attitudes. So against this background and before we proceed with expanding on this aspect of substance use and abuse, let us play a quick game and let us reflect on our own life choices. So this game is just called simply this or that. And I have four slides. All you need to do is answer the questions as truthfully as possible. So this is a fun activity, which you can use as a private reflection on your life choices. If you wish to pop it into the cat space, you're welcome to. But if you wish to just reflect privately, that is perfectly fine. So let's go. This or that. Will you choose a cup of coffee? or will you choose an energy drink? So you can have a, your, you can think about it or you can actually just pop it into chat space. And I see we have some responses to say this, coffee. My second slide, this or that, 
Would you drink for enjoyment? Or would you drink to get drunk? This or that? Okay, so I'm going to move on. Remember, you can privately reflect on these responses. My third slide, this or that? This, would you drink alone? Or that, would you drink socially? You can privately reflect on this. You can pop it in the chat space. You can send an anonymous response to one of the SSS team. And some of us are saying none, I hear you. And finally, this or that? Do you drink to cope or that? Is it drinking for leisure? So I just wanna say thank you very much for your participation, uh, giving thought to these questions, this or that. This was just a brief fun activity and was meant to actually break the ice into the session, but also to help you to reflect on your own life choices and to give context on where you are at. So you can keep them coming in. My colleagues are here and they are welcome to also assist with the chat space. So there's a, a direct message to me. What if enjoyment is getting drunk? I believe that this is how a lot of people feel. Okay, so thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to leave that question as we move on. Mr. Subramani is going to be able to take over in a short while and he'll probably give us more uh, insight into this. So remember one of the questions, Mr. Subramani, is what if enjoyment is getting drunk? Because I believe that this is how a lot of people feel. Thank you so much for that. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to our special guest presenter this afternoon, Mr. Tony Subramani, who is a qualified social worker with 40 years of clinical experience across a diverse field of, field of practice. He is a qualified acute detox specialist. He is a substance abuse therapist. He is a pres presenter for Belito TV, and he is in recovery from addiction for the past 33 years. Mr. Subramani will cover as many aspects as possible in the next 45 minutes. Please take advantage, jot down your questions, and at the end of his presentation, you will dedicate time to answering them. On that note, I hand over to Mr. Subramani. Thank you so much, Rene. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. Let's just get into it. I'm gonna to try to do justice to all of these topics in the next 40, 45 minutes. So um, I also want to say, can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. All right. I just want to, to comment this discussion with the fact that, um, I know, although I've been in recovery for 33 years, really, but when I heard those questions that you put up, those four slides, uh, it really got me thinking as well, because a couple of years ago, my answers would have been, you know, an emphatic yes, yes to all of those things. And uh, I, I sit back and reflect on the years that I've been in recovery. And I realize that there are many, many people that are struggling with those questions right now, and especially with after what we've been through the lockdown. So I'm going to go through these topics as best as I can. And I hope that there will be some questions at the end of the session, which I hope to answer. I'm no authority on addiction and recovery, but I'm gonna share as much as I've got as experience as a social worker and someone who's currently in recovery as well too. And the first question is, you know, we ask ourselves, what is addiction? And I think that would, would put uh, many questions to answer some of the questions that some of the uh, participants may have had. Addiction is basically a psychological or physical um, inability to stop consuming a chemical, a drug or a substance even though the person is aware of the fact that it's causing some psychological and or physical harm or damage. 
The term addiction does not only refer to dependency on substances such as heroin, cocaine, or uh, alcohol. It also includes over-the-counter drugs. We found over the recent years there's been a tremendous increase in over-the-counter drugs, purely because of the fact that you know, you're getting a prescription from a professional, you're getting it from a recognized and registered pharmacist. So people don't really realize the addictive nature of the drugs or the medication that they are on. And we're going to talk about that a little later uh, to a greater extent. Some other addictions also involve an inability to stop participating in activities such as gambling, eating, or working, uh, and also on social media. In these circumstances, the person is described as having a behavioral addiction. Now, when we talk about eating as well, believe it or not, that there is a fellowship known as Overeaters Anonymous, and uh, you can talk to me privately about that if you need more information. The DSM-5, that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also recognizes substances-related disorders from the use of 10 uh, separate classes of drugs. Well, I'm not going to go into the, the 10 of them. You can always just get the information at the later stage. Addiction in the brain, basically what, what's happening with the brain is that the part of the brain that causes the addiction is called the mesolimbic uh, do, uh, dopamine pathway. Now, through the addiction, and that's the continuous use of any of these mood-altering chemicals, brain receptors become overwhelmed or swamped. The brain responds by producing less dopamine and thus eliminates or continues to eliminate gradually uh, some of the dopamine receptors. So there is definitely uh, a brain activity, there is brain damage, and there is also a distortion of the neural pathways in the brain as well as one consumes these mood altering chemicals over a period of time on a continuous basis. It takes approximately 90 days for the dopamine production to return to some what we would call normal levels. Now, I just want to stop here and explain something as well, too. Very often you would hear if you've had the experience of having a, someone admitted to a rehab center or you've had someone who's part of the support system that is like uh, NA or AA, you hear them say that it should be there for three months or give the program a period of 90 days. This is primarily the reason why we say that it should be around 90 days and nothing less, because we're looking at the dopamine production levels to return to normal. That's one of the indicators of some sense of normalcy that, uh, that's, that the person returns to. And that as well, we'll talk about a little later. Now, all of the, 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 the issues around substance abuse and substance admission into rehabs is, con, uh, is managed by the Substance Abuse Act, which is the Act number 70 of, of 2008, and it guides the process of involuntary admission into a rehab center. I, I'm going to expand on this as well. Too. Now, you get very often you get people who refuse to recognize the fact that they have a problem with addiction or they may recognize this as a serious issue, but they refuse to seek any professional help. And it gets to a stage where the family together with the uh, significant others need to actually have this person admitted into a rehab center against his wishes. Now this can be facilitated through a court order. The court can now direct the person to be admitted into a state facility or a private facility for a period not less than 12 months. And during those 12 months, various uh, reviews and reports are submitted to the court uh, while the person is in inpatient treatment program. The process is generally managed by the Department of Social Development or a social worker that's in private practice. <clears throat> the other area that is so crucial in managing addiction is setting boundaries. And boundaries are rules that an addict or alcoholic establishes for themselves, which allows them to develop a healthy relationship with themselves and others as well. Now, it is so, so important that we have to have these boundaries set in place at, during the time that the person is in early recovery. And this is because people, those who are in active recovery basically lose the essence of boundaries and loses the essence of what and significance of other people in their lives and has really not re respected these boundaries for a long, long time. So therefore, it is absolutely crucial that one has to stipulate and set these boundaries with family, with friends, and significant others. Now, boundaries are basically social, and also boundaries with social activities need to be set, 
like non-alcoholic drinks and designated drivers. I just want to expand the non-alcoholic drinks. And my personal opinion, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is also very, very unhealthy. And it is a very, very high risk drink as well too, a, a practice as well. The reason for that is that the only thing we're not participating in is having a drink that has, that has got the, the uh, elements or ingredients of any other alcoholic drink. The rest of it is still the same. It comes, you, you're pouring it in a glass. It has the same if, uh, look as the beer would. It has the same effect in terms of, I mean, the same visual effect when you look at it. All that it misses is having the actual alcoholic element in it. And that is very, very risky because one can eventually lead to taking the alcoholic content as part of the, the, the social drinking thing is that that's what it should be all about. So it's important for the person to understand that. And I also abstain completely from any uh, non-alcoholic drinks as well. That also includes energy drinks as well. The third aspect that one needs to stipulate is boundaries with work. And that's so important when it comes to creating a balance that is personal and professional life as well too. Uh, when we talk about no drugs or alcohol around the addict or in the house, it also is important for the family to respect and recognize the fact that since the person is not taking any alcohol now, there has to be a restriction in terms of having any alcohol in the house, even if someone else is taking it. Now, this can become a very contentious issue, especially if the partner or another family member does participate in these uh, the social activities that do require or, or uh, you know, permit them to have alcohol. But it's important that that person respects the person who's in recovery, especially in early recovery. There should be no dr drugs using friends or, uh, or, or, or associates allowed into the house. That's very, very important as well. And if he arrested, no bail or payment of legal fees to defend himself or herself should be made available, not at all. And this is very important because one needs to look at it. What are we supporting? Are we supporting the person, although he has been off drinks or alcohol for a period of time and he's relapsed? What are we actually supporting when it comes to, comes to paying the bill or legal fees for this person? The other boundary that one needs to look at is also the, the fact that there should be no insults, ridicules, or obscene language, which relates or associates to the mindset of an addict rather than the mindset of someone that's in recovery. Talking of mindset, we're going to expand on that a little later on as well. Too. The number nine boundary that we put in place is no money. And this is also something of a very, very contentious issue. The intention the person has may be very authentic and may, very honest that he or she wants to purchase uh, food or pay for transport or even pay uh, the electricity or the water bill. But the intention is distorted and becomes very, very less important when there is a temptation to actually buy alcohol or drugs with that money. So eventually that loses its essence and one now ends up as, be, as, as in a state of, of a relapse as well. Number 10, no lies or cover up for the addict at any given time, regardless of circumstances. And I want to emphasize this, that family and friends should refrain completely from trying to cover up for the addict uh, under any circumstances. This is either with the police, with the family, or with the, the work situation as well. Because all we're doing is, is basically promoting addiction in his life without the necessary consequences. Are we okay so far, guys? Yes. Okay. You're okay. And lastly, we're looking at setting boundaries around times for meals, returning home, the use of vehicle, use of cell phone. Now, when we talk about these, uh, these boundaries here, as I said a little earlier, the addict or the alcoholic has lost the sense of structure in his or her life. So therefore, it's very, very important to have these boundaries around times uh, uh, set, inside, set in, in, in a written document as well. Now, when we're talking about boundaries, we're going to talk about a document later that's called a relapse prevention plan. And all of these are going to be, will be contained in that document. What are the, some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to someone that's either in active addiction or in, in, uh, in recovery? One of the do do's that we must be very, very uh, careful about is don't use the words that, that label. Avoid referring the person to any term that humiliates or dis shows disrespect. What we can do is express concern and care in a very honest and a very authentic manner. 
communicate directly with the person. Don't connect, communicate through his children or through, through other someone else in the family. That becomes very demeaning for the person. And I think what we need to understand, people, is that we're dealing with someone here that not consciously and deliberately chose to become an addict and an alcoholic, right? It is unfortunately the lifestyle that he or she lives now as a consequence of that choice that he made. So when it comes to communication as well, as well, it is very important that the communication is a supportive way rather than demeaning the person as well too. When it comes to communication, for example, if you're concerned about a friend in recovery, don't ask questions that are directly accusing him of using again. Instead, you know, you should know, I notice you don't seem to be very happy these days. Uh, is something going wrong? Is there anything that we can talk about? And that kind of, so there's a supportive nature to the questions or the communication. Offer to help where you can, but resist the urge to babysit. And I think we, we talked about some of the babysitting uh, aspects when we were talking about setting boundaries as well. Avoid that at all costs. The pe person does not need any babysitting, but rather he or she needs your support. And stay in a, I mean, start a conversation with the person rather than just having these, you know, kind of uh, conversations with just rises just when the need arises as well. Have those conversations on a continuous basis, basis. Let the loved one know that he or she is safe to talk to you and, he, and, 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 sh and share what he or she is actually going through as well. This is so important, especially when it comes to early recovery. Some of the don'ts include, don't be confrontational or integrative, uh, in, interrogative. You can ask simple and direct questions, but just refrain from interrogating the person or being sarcastic. This is sometimes very common because you've looked at this person for such a long time. And there's a very important issue that comes in place, guys. The person is in a program of change. He or she is making the effort to change, and that takes time. It takes about nine to 12 months for someone, for people to actually see these real authentic changes uh, being part of that person's life. While you are seeing these changes, it's important that we also make changes in the terms of the way we, we interact and the way we actually manage this person as well too. So it's important that we also join a support group for family members and, and uh, significant others so that we can also be guided as to how we uh, manage to, to support uh, the person who's in, who's in recovery as well. Don't nag, and that's, that's something that, that is common, but it's something that we need to be very, very cautious and very uh, careful about as well. Don't treat the person like a child, now that it feels that he's in recovery, that you're gonna walk around in eggshells and you've gotta have everything done for him, like you know, having his clothes laid out and having his meals dished out and you're literally spoon feeding him. He doesn't want that. So don't treat him like a child just because you're scared that he's going to relapse as well. And, and we talked earlier about having very clear, very distinct boundaries that you need to also have for yourself regarding how you're going to cope, how you're going to manage, and how you're going to contain some of the section, sessions that uh, the, some of the aspects of recovery that does come up as well. Don't try to rescue them from their own life. Right? Don't do things that they should be doing, even though it could have negative consequences. That's so important. It is very, very important that the person goes ahead with what he has to do, what he's decided to do, even though you may be aware of some of the consequences that he or she may face. What is important is to communicate the concerns you have, but obviously you don't want to live your, uh, your, their life. <clears throat> okay, are we for time? All right, we've got, to, we've got time. Now, this is also a very, very important aspect when it comes to helping someone or supporting someone that is making the effort to recover from addiction as well and enabling behavior, all right? It's so important that we need to do a lot of soul searching in terms of how we've coped and how we've managed and also not manage the person's addiction in, early, in, in, in previous years, years as well. Now, one of the things that we need to be very careful is ignoring the addict's negative or potentially dangerous behavior. I did talk a little bit about that in the previous slide, but we've got to be very careful about the fact that we don't want to overlook the problems or, or deny that there is a problem that exists when the person is presenting with a problem as well. So not being confrontational, but being supportive, but having the open communication about the fact that there is this danger that you do see or you are anticipating 
as far as the, as the person's behavior is concerned. Affecting emotions is also very, very difficult, but it's not, not the person, not the family's place to actually talk on behalf of someone else or to share their emotions, especially if there's negative emotions and there's repercussions for that as well. Prioritizing the addict's needs before their own. And that's why I said it's not about you walking on eggshells and starting to suddenly change the way you live your life and becoming so protective of the addict while you're actually not sharing the freedom and the joy that you should be enjoying as well. Another enabling behavior that we've got to be very conscious of is acting out of, of fear. Since the, addic the addiction uh, can cause frightening events, the enabler will do whatever it takes to avoid such situations. And we need to be very, very aware of that. Sometimes, like for example, the person might say, okay, if I don't get this, I'm going to break the window. So I'm going to smash the door down. And, and don't act out of fear when you're trying to manage that. There's other ways that you can actually adapt to that will actually help you to cope with the situation, even if it does become very threatening as well. Lying to others to cover up the addict's behavior. We talked about that a little earlier on, especially when it comes to work situations, where you're actually lying to the supervisor of the person why he's not at work or why he hadn't been at work for, for a couple of days or weeks or so. Also, mainly, the other part, uh, aspect of behavior, enabling behavior that we need to be very cautious of is blaming people or situations other than the addict. It's so common, guys. It's so common to blame the person's wife for the stuff that they are going through. It's so common to blame a child that may have been problematic in the family. And that's something that we need to be very, very careful about. What purpose does it serve? Is it enabling the addict to continue behaving the way he does? Or is it actually encouraging him to seek help and change the way he lives his life as well? And also it's so dangerous or it is quite risky to resent the addict. And yeah, I wanna bring in the point which is so important. It's something that I bring into my, my counseling sessions uh, very, very often as well. It's called, it's known, known as detaching with love. So you detach from the, the problem or the disease of addiction, but you still hold on to the person with love. You still treat him with love and treat him with, with unconditional love. When you separate the person from the problem, you're able to actually see the person in a very, very different light. So don't resent the person for the fact that he is an addict or, or she is an addict or uh, presenting with, with behavior that's, uh, that's related to the addiction as well. It's so important to just change that way, the way we see it as well. Now, the relapse process. Now, when a person is in recovery, it's so important to understand that we really wish and hope and pray that he or she doesn't relapse. But it is sometimes part of the process. We have to understand that. But if it can be avoided, yes, it should be avoided under all costs. And I'm going to share some ways of actually looking at what is the relapse process and, and how we can be able to observe what really goes on as well. Now, the relapse refers to the process of returning to the full use of drugs or alcohol after the period of abstinence. The relapse is a possibility for regardless of how much of time has been, the person has been sober. Part of the recovery plan should include learning about the relapse process and devising a plan to help prevent the relapse. Now, I spoke to you earlier about a relapse prevention plan. The relapse prevention plan is a detailed document that is prepared with the family, the person concerned, and the professional that's actually putting this plan together that re re will relate to various aspects that the person needs to adhere to, agree to, and understand the consequences if he or she does deviate from what he has agreed to. The relapse prevention plan, as I said, also includes warning signs, and it also includes uh, life plan. Warning signs are where the family members or significant others are picking up signs that are indicating old behavior, where the person is not taking care of his personal hygiene, if the person is not following the time schedules, is going to work late, or coming back late, and that kind of stuff. So those, all of those warning signs are needed to be tabulated and put out in this document so that it is something that all parties are aware of when, uh, when they're signing the document. A life plan is about when the person changes his work environment or whether, whether he's actually an unemployed and he now joins a company as full-time employment, when he gets married or if he gets divorced or he's moving uh, to another province or another city, 
All of that is contained in the life plan and that has to be documented and continuously revised as the plans change. Now, behavior changes, as in, what we're looking at when it comes to the relapse pr uh, process is behavior changes. That's very, very common. And, and it's not obvious to the, ad, the recovering addict or alcoholic, but it's very obvious to, to family members. Where there's increased episodes of arguing with others for no apparent reason, the decrease of stopping of support meetings like AA and NA, uh, a stopping in a bar to socialize and drink a soda, very common. Increased stress symptoms, such as smoking more cigarettes or eating more food than usual. I, I just want to elaborate on this thing about stopping at a pub for a, to, to, to actually socialize and have a cool drink. In my counseling and also personally, I do not ever, ever support that practice at all. Now, maybe some of you are sitting and thinking, but it's an innocent thing. He's just going into the bar. He's going to talk to his friends that he's you know, been associated with previously. He's having a soda, nothing wrong with that. And, and, he, and he's going to come back home. Well and good, but one needs to look at the association with the environment. It's so important to understand that that environment really is very, very conducive to his old behavior. And it actually relates and associates itself to his old behavior. So even though his intention is very genuine and very strong in the sense that he doesn't want to pick up a drink at that time when he's there, the possibility is greater because he's continuously associating with what I call the playgrounds. Now, if you look at the very bottom of the slide, it says avoid the three Ps, which is your playmates, your playgrounds, and your play toys. But we're going to talk, talk about that a little later on. So if you've got someone who's in recovery and is now saying, irrespective of what period of time the person has been in recovery, it's very important to understand that this should not be happening, where he stops at a pub just to say, I have a soda, watch the, the soccer on the, on, on the big screen, and then come home. Very, very risky behavior, which is something uh, that can lead to a relapse uh, pretty quickly. The other aspect that one needs to look at is attitude change. Uh, and changes that include like not caring about their sobriety anymore, not really talking about the recovery anymore or what had happened, becoming too negative about life and how things are going. Changes in feelings or moods, increased moodiness or depression, uh, strong feelings of anger at oneself or another, increased feelings of boredom or uh, sudden feelings of euphoria. You've got to be very, very observant about how these, these changes are taking place and how long is it going on for. You know, if it's consistently going on, it's a cause for concern. So all of these need to be very, very carefully monitored, especially by the family. And all of this is contained in that document I'm, I'm referring to, which is a relapse prevention plan. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's no one that has, that has been in recovery, especially in early recovery, and they do not have a relapse prevention plan, then one needs to get that taken care of as soon as possible. Then also changes in feelings. Okay, we've talked about that. We talked up, we need to also talk about changes in thoughts. And this is also some crucial area that one needs to focus on when we're trying to prevent a relapse taking place. You know, thinking about alcohol or drugs were deserved due to being sometimes you actually, you know, sober for six, seven months and you're thinking or, or talking about drugs as though it, it's deserved as a celebration after all these months that you've been clean thinking it wouldn't be harmful to substitute one drink or one drug. Uh, you know, after all this time, it, you know, people say, oh, listen, what is one drink going to do? And I had that kind of question put to me, you know, a few months into my recovery. Hey, come on, you know, just one beer. I mean, it's not going to, you know, mess up the whole plan. Be very careful. And that's something that one needs to adhere to very, very carefully. Remember, it was the first drink that drove us to hell, not the last one. And also another way, is, you know, you, you talk about continuing to smoking uh, uh, weed or uh, Zol and abstaining from alcohol, but containing uh, others that are containing or using uppers, thinking about the alcohol or drug problem was cured because uh, there's no substance that we use for the period of, of, of weeks or months. Now, there is something that we need to be very, very careful about. When we're talking about being addicted to mood altering chemicals, it's across the board, ladies and gentlemen. If a person has been addicted to just taking beers only and drinking beers on a continuous basis, and that led to his addictive lifestyle, he cannot now switch and say, well, listen, I'll have a, a tot of whiskey now and again, and it's not gonna cause major effect in my life. 
we need to understand we're talking about mood altering chemicals right across the board. So it's any mood altering chemical, and that also includes the um, energy drinks as well. And earlier on, I was telling you about the, the three P's, which the person needs to be aware of and adhere and stick, stay away from is your playmates. It's not healthy to associate with people that you've been with while you've been in active addiction, because they may not be ready to actually stop that behavior and give up on their addiction. And when you join them, although your intention is very innocent, the chances of you relapsing are very, very great. Also playgrounds, like I've, I've said earlier on, you know, to just sit in the pub and watch uh, the soccer match is a very dangerous situation or uh, practice. And your play toys are stuff that you've got at home, like your uh, tot measures and all these memorabilia that you've saved over the years that's related to your drinking. Maybe it's, it's a tot or, a, or a alcohol that you bought overseas some years ago and all of that. We need to get rid of it because it serves no purpose anymore. Okay, I'm sorry, guys, that I'm rushing, but I've got quite a lot to, to cover in this few minutes. So bear with me, and I'm sure that you could go back to the recording at a later stage if you need to just uh, refresh your memory around these, these aspects as well. Now, we've got a whole list of hurdles in recovery that is so, so important for us to recognize and, and understand as well. When we are blaming others for the person's recovery, it can become very, very dangerous. And the reason for that is that that person who has been in active addiction is not taking full responsibility for his or her behavior as an addict or an alcoholic. The second one is ongoing temptation. And a very common one is where there's other members, members in the family that are participating in social activities that include alcohol or uh, yeah, mainly alcohol. So we've got to be very careful of how we're managing that in the home environment. Number three is failure to make lifestyle changes. It's automatic that after three months, on an average three months, one is in recovery, he or she will automatically start to make lifestyle changes. It's not only the, uh, physically, but it's also mentally, you'll start seeing the person getting involved in a lot of other activities that he or she may not, be, not have been involved in previously. And it's crucial to look at all that taking place. If that's not evident, then we've got to be very careful that it could pose as an hurdle uh, in recovery. And simply what I'm meaning is that you cannot resolve the problem of addiction with the same mind that created that problem. It has to be a development and sus sustaining a totally different mindset, which is around addiction. And if we take care of all of this on this list here, then we're definitely creating and strengthening a mindset of, uh, of recovery. Relationships with children can become a very, very uh, massive hurdle as well, where the Children are not allowed to see the father or mother now that they're in recovery. There's, there's this major gap between you know, the children and the person who's in recovery and, and, and those kinds of things. Maybe not even allowed to take a phone call or while they're on a call, someone is listening in and you know, prompting children to say things and all of that. Those are kinds of issues that can become very, very serious in the person's recovery as well. And again, if these things can't be managed uh, with the family, then one needs to seek uh, the professional up in terms of facilitating those kinds of changes when it comes to children, the relationship with the recovering mom or dad. Relationship with the spouse as well. You know, very often, okay, I shouldn't say so very often, but we, we hear it come up from time to time where the spouse says, oh, well, look, I don't have a problem with addiction, so I don't see why I should change. And that's something that can become very, very risky and it can lead to addiction, to recover, to, to, to a relapse as well. Where the spouse needs to understand that her attitude and the way of coping with things now has to change because her husband is obviously making the necessary changes to get his life on the right track and start to embrace a better version of himself as well. New relationships can become a very serious hurdle as well. And this might be quite a, a strange comment I'm making but it is very, very important to understand that if a person is in a relationship, when he or she gets into recovery, then for all intent and purpose, they should remain in that relationship unless it's absolutely uh, really, really at a very, very serious stage and there's attorneys involved and it's probably going to be uh, leading to divorce, then we can understand. But otherwise, even if it has been a very, very difficult relationship, it's important to try to work through that relationship 
when the person is in early recovery. If the person has not been in a relationship to, when he gets into recovery, then it is very, very strongly recommended that he or she does not get into a relationship for at least the next year. Yes, at least for the next year. And the reasons are pretty obvious. You know, you don't want to carry the burden and the baggage of what you've had in your previous relationships into new relationships. And one of the very, very big risk factors here is that we tend to forget we're in recovery and we want to portray the great person with great personality and all of that to the new partner. And we actually forget who we are and we lose our identity. May I just say at this point here that recovery is an inward journey. Recovery is a journey of connecting with yourself. And that's so important to look at that journey at least unhindered and, un, and, and, and the least distracted for the next year. The other uh, aspect that can become a very serious hurdle in recovery is your debt. And one needs to look at how do you manage to pay this debt off and what plan do you have to, to overcome that? Um, others are like crisis building, being unemployed, complacency. I want to talk about complacency here. It's so crucial to understand that it's just not about whiling your way and just cruising your way to re recover. It requires you to be consistently focusing on recovery and embracing the changes that one needs to do so while you're in active recovery. It's not about the old person just managing to stay uh, free or stay away from a drink or a drug. That is one that we call uh, as a dry drunk, okay? And honesty, absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial as to how we, we cope with being honest in, in, uh, in our life and honest in, in early recovery as well. Because we, as people who have, me, for example, who have been in active addiction, have been full of lies and dishonesty. So we need to now start living a life that is based on honesty and uh, respect. All right, I'm not going to spend too much of time on this yet. I'm just going to share it with you. And uh, we're just running out of time here. So, okay, support groups. Guys, it is so important for the person to be part of a support group when he or she is in, in recovery. The support groups are absolutely wonderful uh, groups where you can actually con uh, to, to, to actually mix and mingle with people that are in recovery. These people, I would say, talk your language. And the common groups that we have is Alcoholics Anonymous, as I said earlier on, Overeaters Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. And, and, and the amazing thing about these groups is that they also include platforms for the partners and children to be part of the discussion uh, as well around their own uh, challenges with the person that has been in active addiction. So the support groups are absolutely essential, absolutely uh, necessary when a person is in recovery as well. I've, I've been in recovery for 33 years. I still go to my AA meetings as, not as often as I used to, but I do maintain my contact with the AA group and that's basically for three reasons. Number one, I'd like to be there when a newcomer walks in, like someone was there when I walked in. I like to know what happens in this fellowship so that I can strengthen my own recovery. And thirdly, I like to know what happens to those who don't join this group because those are the stories and those are the, the, the experiences that we grow from as well. And the other pillar that is very crucial is for the person to get a sponsor. And I'm not talking about uh, financial sponsorship. I'm talking about someone who at least has a minimum of three years of recovery time who is basically there to walk this person through early recovery, take them through the step work that's uh, in the fellowship of AA and NA, and help them to actually start to strengthen their own recovery in, in, in <clears throat> the beginning stages as well. And they, you can have a, 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 temporary, spo a temporary sponsor and, and eventually and get someone that would be a little bit more permanent in terms of your recovery as well. Advisor could be a spiritual advisor, it could be a social worker, it could be a counselor from the rehab center. It's important to maintain contact with these people for at least a year for these uh, professional services to be made available. Uh, Self-care and self-image, we talked about time management, absolutely crucial. That's something that is also a very, very important pillar in your recovery. Counselor, like myself, where there's a one-on-one -on -one interaction, I actually work with the individual. I work with the partner or the spouse if he or she is available. And I work with the families as well because addiction is a family disease. And as much as it's affected me, it's also affected 16 or more people in and around myself as well too. And number seven, emotional responsibility. 
where we need to look at how we're managing ourselves and uh, our emotions. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this a little later on, if time permits, in terms of how do we actually detox uh, emotionally. Okay, after rehab, what happens quickly, right? <clears throat> this is something that we need to be very, very careful about, right? And I, and I, and I talked a little bit about it before. And understand that the person didn't choose to become an addict. It was out of, you know, his behavior, his choice he made earlier, and the consequences are such. Because I also didn't believe as a qualified social worker that I'll end up as an alcoholic as well. But it happened. Uh, addiction can happen to anyone at any time. Don't bring up the past while you did, while we're trying to rebuild our future. It's not fair to keep picking on that and bringing that up and talking about it because it serves no purpose, but it's a very common practice among some family members and we need to put a stop to them. The reality about it, believe it or not, is that we never wanted to hurt anyone or disappoint anyone. I mean, there are many, many times I went to bed very, very angry and disappointed with myself because I'd let people down. It wasn't my intention, but it was through my excessive drinking that it had been part of the, one of the consequences that they faced and I had to face as well. It was not intentionally done and it wasn't something that anyone enjoyed. They were still them under, under the, underneath their addiction. You know, we're talking about identity. We're talking about the person's identity. And that is important to understand that giving credit, giving the respect uh, and giving the time while he's actually managing his recovery as well. And they need your support all the time and, and don't give up because there are times when the person will make that breakthrough, when he has that breakthrough, just because you've stuck around and you've been there through the, with them through the diffi most difficult times. <clears throat> okay, we've talked about uh, the recovery groups. We've talked about, uh, you know, creating a balance in terms of your habits like cooking and eating, exercising. All of that will be part of the self-image and the change in attitude and change in the way of living your, your life. <clears throat> don't allow triggers or temptations at home. Listen to when, when they talk. Okay, don't ignore the person because he's now in recovery and devalue him because he has he wants to say something, give him a chance and give him that opportunity as well. Be patient and know the signs of a relapse. Now, a little earlier on, I was telling you about emotional detoxing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the modalities that I bring into my own counseling sessions which I've found to be absolutely powerful and the results have been phenomenal. I have qualified as an acute detox specialist uh, about six years ago. And the reason for that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that I've been in recovery for many, many years. And I've been counseling families and individuals for many years, but I, I wanted to try and work out why would some people, you know, relapse? What's the reason for them relapsing? And why would they want to go back and, live a life that they dreaded for many, many years. And I realized that one of the aspects that is not really managed very well in general counseling is the emotional detox. And when we actually involve in, in counseling, it's at that level, but acute detox is at a much deeper level. It's a very deep uh, cellular level that we go through. And as this, the, the picture indicates, it's five needles, acupuncture needles on each yellow, and the process is known as acute detox. It's auricular acupuncture, where we have the five point um, uh, on each yellow. And the person actually sits with these needles for about 40 to five, 45 minutes while he listens to some very calming and very soothing music. What it does is basically balancing the energy, energy within you, the yin and the yang. When you actually balance the energy within you, you don't have any temptation or urge to pick up something outside of you to make you feel good on the inside. That's primarily what it is. Helps with insomnia, anxiety, ADHD, pain, uh, addiction, and smoking as well. Amazingly, it helps people to overcome smoking a smoking habit with just one session. And that's how powerful it is. But you're welcome to contact me and consult with me privately if you want to know more information about that. This is the emotional chart that's so much so related to acute detox. If you look at all of this, the columns A and B, it's basically what every individual has gone through in their lives. And it's currently some of us are also going through it, anger, depression, failure, anxiety, humiliation, all of this stuff here. If you're just looking at row two, we look at anxiety, despair, disgust, nervousness, and worry. That the the though the 
the toxins on those emotions are in, uh, is embedded in your spleen and your stomach. When you look at anger, which is a very, very common emotional issue in recovery, it's embedded in your liver and your gallbladder. So the five-point NADA protocol basically helps to eradicate and bring down the levels of the toxicity that is attached to these emotions in the different organs as well. So it's, it's you know, I could go on for another hour or so talking about this here, but the effects, as I said, have been phenomenal. And uh, I have testimonials, uh, plenty of them to, to uh, su support uh, what I'm saying right now as well. Too. And it can work for any, any individual, not necessarily someone that is in, in recovery or in addiction. That's where I am now. You can take my contact details and get in touch with me, but I am so sorry I had to rush through all of this here. Oh my goodness, we've only got seven minutes. Sorry, Willie, but uh, I hope that we've got, we can just go through some questions quickly. My, my apologies for giving us such a limited time. No, that's, that's fine, Tony. Thank you so much. I, I think I just love the angle with which you brought this uh, presentation to us. It was beyond just education and awareness for ourselves. But I think more and more we find that we are actually amongst our loved ones who, yes. who need to, our support and our care. And I, and I love the way you, you showed us how to advocate for people around us. So yeah. indirectly, it was our own education and awareness, but it was also helping us to lobby and advocate for others. So I really enjoyed yeah. that. Uh, thank thank you. you for that. Let's open it out to the floor. Yeah. We have a few minutes for any questions to, uh, uh, for Mr. Subramani. He's covered a range of aspects uh, from education awareness to dealing with relapse and recovery. I love the aspect on boundaries. Uh, and there were lots of very, very valuable messages that you've shared with us. <clears throat> so um, I'm not sure if uh, there are any questions. You could even pop it into the chat space. So, so Tony, I think you can see that question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is such, a, such an important question, and I appreciate the person who's asked this question here. You know, it's not only struggling through their studies while they're dealing with it, but people are struggling with so many aspects in their life right now. All I want to say is reach out to some person or an organization that is going to help this person here. The reality about it is very often, really, we think we can manage, we can cope, and, and we don't need any outside support. And I want to encourage people to understand that this is so important to reach out beyond the family and get the necessary help and support that the person deserves as well. You know, the reality is that person may not feel very comfortable reaching out. At least if you can be the spokesperson and say, listen, I have had contact with so-and-so, you know, give this person a call and let's see what comes off that day. It's, as I said, it's happened to people who have lost loved ones during the lockdown. We've had so much of issues around finances. We've had around, you know, issues, people losing work. And, and there's been, oh, just untold issues that came up during the lockdown. So that's such an important question. And if the person wants to consult with me, or I mean, contact me privately, I can, uh, you know, point out some of the resources that are available to assist this person and the family as well. Wonderful question. And, and just to add to that as well, I mean, our students are welcome to even chat with anyone at Student Support Services. And we could also make some referrals to organizations uh, in order to best support them. Thanks, Willie. That's so very really important. And thanks so much for that information as well. Mm. So there's a question oh, on so addiction to social media. It's crazy, guys. Social media, this is it. You know, I never knew a few years ago that my office will be this, this device here, right? But it's become a necessary evil. And, and it's just on the click of a button, you've got all the social media platforms there. And I have an old program in terms of how one can actually manage to overcome the addiction to social media. And, and, and there's ways and means of actually looking at it where you, you are now required and through a, um, what we call an accountability partner, disconnect from all social media platforms and then start building on the one that you need to just because of the work or your study uh, requires only. So there's a whole lot of uh, ways and means of overcoming that, but that's also such an important issue to be concerned about, social media and its addictive nature. 
The other thing that's become very common as well, quickly I want to say, uh, Willie, is the fact that we want, well, not we, but many people are depending on external validation for who they are and what they have as potential. And what I'm saying is that it's all within you. Internal validation is so important. Make the mirror your friend and rather than having to look at the ticks and the likes on social media. Mm -hmm. But I can go on and on about that another half an hour if you give me time. But again, I'm saying someone, it is such an important thing to consult with people that can help you to overcome that. The first thing is to understand that it is a problem and you need help. And I love what you said earlier about it's not your fault. Yes. You know, and and, and yes. yeah, and that yeah. it's an inward journey. So yes. they were very powerful reflections that came through. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I see that um, we also... Uh, Prof. Alder mm -hmm. says that, you know, we need a session on this and that was on the social media because yeah, it's uh, yeah. self-sabotaging. Yes, activity. it is, it is self-sabotaging activity. But also I, I want to say that, you know, you've got to be kind to yourself. It's not that you just willingly and consciously chose to become so addicted. It grows on you. And, and that's how the world functions. I mean, I, I live in an area where we have two massive discam stores right here, one up, up, opposite each other. Now I'm saying this because you know over-the-counter medication has become so common. So the world enjoys all of this while we are the victims of all of this here. But be be kind to yourself and understand that you know you can get over this and 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 seek the necessary help that you. Yeah, thanks for the the comment, interesting and informative presentation. Again, will you my apologies? I rushed through, but I tried to put as much as I can because it's the only time I had. And I'm glad that you recorded it so that your, your students can go back and reflect on all of this as well too. Thank you so much. Definitely. No. So, Tony, on behalf of the Student Support Services team and uh, our team from the Postgrad Support Program, we just want to say thank you uh, for, for, for giving us your time, for uh, you know, sharing your expertise, your knowledge, your skill, your many years of experience in this field. And I think not just as a counselor, but also from your perspective of a recovering addict and uh, also sharing with us the new trends and treatment options that are in place. Uh, for me, uh, I take away a lot from this session because we are surrounded by loved ones and particularly the youth who, are, who have become you know, addicted to substances and we see uh, our mental health, the effects on mental health of our students and it's so critical for us to be able to know how to actually manage this. Absolutely. So you've really helped my colleagues and myself as well. So, uh, yeah, I would just like to say thank you. I hand over to well, Prof. Lini. Thank, thanks for having me on. It was a, an absolute pleasure. Uh, and, and this is my passion. This is what I live for every day is to help others to embrace this journey called recovery and enjoy the quality of life after addiction. So again, you're welcome. Anyone's welcome to just connect with me if you need any information or you want to just chat, uh, you're welcome to do so. Thank you so much to all the participants and uh, thank you, Willie, for having me on and all the very best for the rest of the year with the studies with your students as well. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much for joining us, Tony. Thanks to the thank SSS you. team for inviting you as well and for hosting this wonderful discussion. I doubt this will be the last time we'll hear from you, Tony. I hope <laughs> sure. not. Um, no, it's been such a fantastic session. Um, right. So I just, uh, I, mean, I need to then end off with a reminder that our next session will be on Tuesday next week. Um, I'll be hosting a discussion with Dr. Rebecca Tadukera about exploring career options outside of the academic environment. So please stay tuned next week on Tuesday. Um, Oh goodness, I forgot the date. See you next week then, <laughs> on Tuesday. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for participating. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank uh, you very much.